Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and before we get rolling today, I wanted to invite you to ask me anything. (laughs) I would love to know how this show could be super helpful to you, and I figure one of the ways to do that is to have you actually record messages and send them to me that I could play on the show, or write to me at hello at brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H. And let me know what your questions are about a particular condition and how Chinese medicine might see that condition, about health and healing, about mindfulness, about qigong, about anything that you are curious about, maybe that you've heard on the show or maybe that you wish you had heard on the show or anything going on in your own life. And I would love to fill an entire episode with answering your questions or perhaps sprinkle them in to episodes relating to the topic that you're asking about. So get out your phone, record a voice memo and email it to hello at brodywelch.com. I'm super curious about what you are curious about and I'm excited to answer your questions. Of course, I can't diagnose or treat via an email or a voice memo, but we can certainly talk about whatever it is you are curious about. To pick my brain in further detail about your personal circumstances, you can go to brodywelch.com and learn how to work with me one-on-one as a coach or health consultant or as an acupuncture and herbs patient. And now on to today's conversation. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and We've been talking a lot on the show lately about body-mind connection, developing a relationship with our bodies that can help us calm down, that can be a pathway in towards helping ourselves psychologically, and just in general, cultivating a deeper relationship with this vehicle that we inhabit, our bodies. We're going to be continuing talking about the body today with my guest, Lauren Geertsen, who's a body connection coach who helps women heal their relationship with food and body image. It's pretty tough to actually have a relationship with something that we might have negative feelings about. And so we're going to get into today about something she calls the invisible corset, which is the title of a book that she has coming out, the invisible corset and how it binds women to body hatred and how we can get free. In her previous work as a nutritional consultant, Lauren realized that the underlying problem for her clients was distrust of their bodies, which resulted from wearing this invisible corset. We have talked before, as she's been a previous guest on A Healthy Curiosity, and she is really fun to dance with. I can vouch for that in personal experience. Her website, empoweredsubstance.com, has supported over 40 million readers with holistic recipes and resources, and I'm delighted to have her back on the show today. Lauren Geertsen, welcome back to A Healthy Curiosity. Hey, Brody. It is so good to chat with you again. It is always a pleasure, and I am so excited that you have written such an important book because, and people who listen to the show frequently know that I don't just blindly endorse everyone that comes on the show. Like I definitely have people that I don't necessarily agree with 100% on everything, or 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 even it's I'm essentially I'm allowing them to present a platform that I feel some distance from, and this is absolutely not the case with you. This book really hit home for me as someone who grew up in a leotard hating her body. And so I I could really relate to a lot of it and feel like working on healing my relationship with my body has been a long and difficult road and is still, frankly, a work in progress if I'm really honest about it. So I'm excited on a personal level as well as for all of my clients and patients out there for whom I know this is an issue. Why don't you start by talking about what this invisible corset is and why you wrote the book? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I also grew up in a leotard hating my body. So <laughs> we definitely have that piece in common. The invisible corset is a set of culturally inherited beliefs that make women as physically uncomfortable and basically mentally and physically restricted as traditional whalebone corsets once did. But the problem is because it's a set of beliefs and like it's the water that we swim in, it's that much harder to to take off and to get free. And so I truly believe that this is the continuation of women's liberation for our generation. Like I look back and my, my great grandmothers and grandmothers did the work of getting the right to vote and getting equal education and, you know, getting career opportunities, but we still have more work to do. And this time it deals with freeing ourselves from this internalized oppression because truly, at least in Western culture, we women are the ones holding ourselves back. Like we're the ones who are spending more money on beauty than our education. And we're the ones who are missing out on family events or work events because we don't feel good or we don't want to put on a bikini or a bathing suit. And we're also the ones who are passing down this fear of our natural bodies to our our daughters. And that's really where my heart is. I believe that it is our responsibility in this generation to end that cycle of female body hate. So that's why I wrote the book. It's a big goal right there, but I do believe it is possible. And so, so essential. I mean, we, the, what what's at stake here? Well, first of all, I'm, our happiness. Women on average, there's been different polls for this, but we'll spend two hundred to 300000 dollars on beauty in our lifetime. And that's, again, like enough for a a Harvard education. And if this approach worked, we would be happy by now. Like we would have the relationships we wanted, the work success that we wanted, the sex lives we wanted, because this is all that beauty culture promises to us if we change and coerce and control our bodies enough. But truly we've tried this long enough. I mean, we've tried it for centuries with breaking and binding our feet and then wearing real corsets. And and now it's taking the form of cosmetic surgery and and Botox and obsessive dieting. But we've, we've tried all these approaches as a female collective, but also in our own lives to realize that we're never going to find that sense of enoughness, that sense of I am enough to live the life and do the work that my soul came here to do. And I I do believe, and I think 2020 is making this very evident that we are, as a world and a a global community, on the cusp of, of something really important and freeing our souls to do that spiritual work of courage and love and truth is more important than ever before. But if we are held back by this belief of my physical body isn't good enough, or, you know, this underlying fear and shame of our natural bodies or fear of our bodies aging, we're not going to be able to do that work for the world. It's so true. We have, there's so many things that we can be putting our time, talent, energy, attention, and money towards other than controlling our bodies and making them look a certain way so that we can what feel safe in the patriarchy? Um, you know, there, there's, there is, there are better things to do with our with, with all of that, and and it really is an obstacle to us living, I think, fully authentically. Yes, and something I talk about in the book as well is this difference between our our true self and our false self, and this goes right to what you talked about authentic living. We can't live authentically unless we know who we truly are. And the problem with the invisible corset and with beauty culture is that it's actually a system of indoctrination and brainwashing. So basically we're all raised in this cult, this cult-like belief system. So we actually don't know our true opinions and we don't know who we truly are. That's what happens in a cult. And so it's really crucial that we do that in our work if if we want to give ourselves a chance at that authentic living. And yet, because as you said, it is the water that we're swimming in. It's literally all around us. It's super hard to 
disengaged from it. And I was really struck in in the book how you describe the beauty industry as an abuser, <laughs> like like a, you draw the analogy to someone who's being an, abused in an interpersonal intimate relationship that in a sense, beauty culture has that that sense of control and like doling out your confidence to you to suit itself. <laughs> and, like mm-hmm. that just struck me as like, yeah, that that's that's really true if they, that we have to be so focused in order to feel like we are okay. So how do we get outside of it? Like if it if it's literally everywhere, if it's a, it's in the media, it's a, if it's in you know on television, it's in movies, it's in it's on social media. That there's diet culture and fitness culture, all, all of this sort of what the body's supposed to look like is pretty ubiquitous. Any any advice for how we can get a sense of like how to how to stop buying into it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a big question. Uh, can I? take a moment and and talk about the five strings of the corset because those are like the five main oh please do yeah okay Mm -hmm. so when we can start to see this then we can start to understand how we're being manipulated so the first string is fear and this is being afraid of the natural state of our body especially this is a big one um the natural aging process of our body and uh we have this phrase body dysmorphia, which means seeing the kind of natural variation of one's own body, you know, natural body features as being wrong. And we obsess about it or obsess about our weight. And then the same way I talk to my clients about this term age dysmorphia, which is where you see the signs of aging, whether it's wrinkles, gray hair, you know, a softer body that comes with menopause. When we see these things as wrong, and when instead they're just the natural process of, of the body, just like losing our baby teeth and gaining adult teeth, it's that neutral. So noticing the sensation of fear or when fear or insecurity is motivating beauty choices, that's a big one. The next string is domination. And what's really important to understand is a, a big piece of history that's been left out of of our education, which is in pre-agricultural times, there were goddess-worshipping societies across the world. And this paradigm was completely different than what we now know as reality. It was based much more in partnership with the earth rather than ownership with the earth. And therefore, it was based much more in partnership with our bodies instead of ownership with our bodies. And it it breaks my heart that our our history lessons just kind of leave this out of, we came from this origin, no matter what culture we came from. So that's an important piece to understand and to start recognizing, you know, when are we behaving from a body ownership, uh, this belief that we get to do what we want to with our bodies according to societal standards, rather than a, a body partnership, which would like be with interacting with your body as if it was your soulmate or your spouse and you wanted to make long-term life plans with their input. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. I think of my, one of my rallying cries of the past few years has been to embody self-respect and how do we do that? Right. Like literally how do we live and breathe from a place of, of respecting ourselves. And that implies allowing the body to speak, allowing the body to be tired and give it rest, it, to need movement and give it exercise, to need nourishment and give it food. Just these absolute basics that are that when we start overriding our body's wisdom, we're telling ourselves we don't matter. And mm-hmm. we're telling ourselves that the body isn't smart and doesn't actually have this incredible warehouse of, of wisdom that we can tap into if we can only listen. And anyway, I, I, I don't want to derail you, but yes, to the idea of being in dialogue with our bodies leading to leading to a certain amount of self-confidence and 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 a feedback loop where we start taking better care of ourselves and we start feeling stronger and better about ourselves from the inside out. I love that tie to self-respect. That you're so on it and I that actually leads me perfectly so thank you. That leads me perfectly to the next string which is disconnection. And when we are acting towards our bodies from the state of fear and domination, what we end up doing is disconnecting from that wisdom within us that you just talked about. 
And we also end up disconnecting basically from our sixth sense, which is the energetic communication between the human body and all of nature and all of other humans as well. This, this subtle energy that our ancestors used to communicate in ways with each other and with the earth that we have completely lost touch with. And so that is just one of the the most truly liberating things is to reconnect with that, that wisdom and reconnect with our ability to gain wisdom from the nature around us and then make life choices based on that. And, and that's really where global healing comes in as well. Just to, to, to ground that in an example is, would that be something like if you, if you stop disconnecting from your body, maybe by going to like, well, how many, how many carbs should I eat today? And like, and letting this sort of abstract concept dictate what you're, how you're going to nourish yourself. If instead you were like, what do I, okay, it's a cold, rainy winter day. What do I feel like putting into my body? Should that be a cold, icy smoothie, (laughs) you know, like, or should, (laughs) because intuitively we know that that's the wrong choice. And like, if we ask our bodies, if we're, if we're connecting to our bodies, we know we're much more likely to get to an answer that is actually going to support our digestion. That's actually going to make us feel good. That's actually going to that satisfy us on a number of levels. Totally, totally. And where I see that mentality coming from as well is uh, almost turning our bodies into a math equation, right? That's where this calorie counting or macro counting or rule following mm-hmm. situation with a lot of diets come from. And, and I, I, do want to offer the disclaimer that I healed my own autoimmune disease through a very rigorous uh, dietary protocol. So I know there's a place for that. And, and, but uh, the kind the diet culture that we live in where people are pursuing these dietary regimes with the intention of controlling their body rather than reconnecting to their body's wisdom around, you know, autoimmune healing. I think that's where we get derailed. I appreciate that distinction. That's really because sometimes we do need to follow rules, right? There's some mm-hmm. things where like cutting out gluten, cutting out dairy might be absolutely vital in order for you to really move the needle on on where you are health wise. And sometimes that's not what any part of us wants, you know. Like mm-hmm. that that is something <laughs> right. that we need to steer ourselves towards in from from a place of of love and caring. But it's not necessarily easy. And but getting. I think that comes with um, a certain level of discerning our own motivations. Right. And I think too, recognizing or allowing the, what we really want to grow in us. Like, yeah, I want to eat bread, real bread sometimes, but what I want even more than that is the uh, ability to, you know, have a really upbeat emotional mental state and to feel good in my body. And I know I'm not going to have that for about three days after I eat gluten. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Got um, it. So it's, it's really, it, it's having that kind of whole bigger picture perspective of the consequences. Yeah. Well, at least that was for me personally. Yeah. So yeah. these three, you've mentioned three of these strings of the course that we've got fear, mm-hmm. we've got domination, we've got disconnection. Mm-hmm. What are the last two? The next one is mechanization. And this is what I mentioned about turning our bodies into a math equation. But the bigger picture here is that our whole scientific, well, Western scientific perspective, which developed in the early 1500s with the scientific revolution and and the fathers of science starting to look at the universe through the lens of a a machine or a piece of divine clockwork. And then Descartes took that even further to then perceive human beings as having a a machine-like body. And this has just been evolved through the centuries to develop into reductionism and and materialism in, in science. So it's a deeply ingrained mentality that our bodies are machine-like they're predictable. We can put rules on them. We can expect them to follow certain rules or have certain outcomes based on uh, variables that we introduce. And, and that's really just not the case because they're living beings. They're more right. like, like if you're trying to control a puppy, not yeah. this toy car. 
It's absolutely, that's that sort of Cartesian split between body and mind and the body as machine is one of the central differences, I think, between thinking about the body from a Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic perspective, where you're this dynamic sea of energy that's dynamic and changing all the time, or it's, and you're all the systems interrelate as, as an ecosystem, as opposed to you're a bunch of parts that need to be swapped out, maintained in this very regimented way. And that, and frankly, that wear out as we age, I think that's also something we don't have to buy into. Such a great point. And uh, the last string here is coercion. And this is where I talked about beauty culture being an abuser, a psychological abuser. So we have to recognize how our opinions are being coercively manipulated. So a lot of women, and I used to say this too, when it came to my beauty routine and the fact that I woke up 30 minutes before my college roommate so that nobody would see me without makeup. And I, I would have insisted, no, I'm wearing makeup for me because it makes me feel good. And And, you know, so many of the clients I work with say that, or now I'm seeing women say this a lot when it comes to inherently body harming practices like cosmetic surgery and Botox and lip injections. They say, oh, I'm choosing it. I'm doing it for me. But we have to understand that we have been subtly and insidiously coerced and actually brainwashed by the propaganda of the beauty industry to make choices that that are in its best interest rather than our best interest and the best interest of our bodies. So we actually don't know what our true opinions are and what our, our true choices are until we recognize that coercion and, and we start to deprogram it, just like somebody needs to deprogram when they come out of a cult. Yes. And, and much like racism and sexism and all the other isms, right? That, that what society puts on you and how it, the, sort of the internalized expectations that you feel like that, that is something to, that, that takes work to sort out, like actually <laughs> totally. to, to move through it. And so recognizing that, that standards of beauty are, are things that are, they are culturally imposed in the fact that like um, obviously like they're they're different from culture to culture but i think it's fair to say that materialism and it kind of the the making money off of off of selling people products to make them quote unquote more beautiful is something that the united states has exported and <laughs> something mm-hmm. that and you know that really this sort of western standard is spreading throughout the world exactly and that you know seems like every time i talk about uh, or try to dismantle the beauty standard, inevitably somebody is going to say, well, it's only natural that women try to look a certain way to gain male approval. It's evolutionary, but it's exactly like you said, these standards of beauty vary so drastically from culture to culture. And even from decade to decade, we basically treat the female body like a clothing style where in, for example, Victorian era, we're using bustles and corsets to obtain an absolutely cartoonish and unnatural body shape, you know, a, a body shape that another human body is going to know that this is fake. Like the, the human body is functioning at a level of subconscious perception that really does know what is real, what's not like, what's a Botox forehead? What's a actually young, fertile woman's face look like? Um, if we're talking in terms of biology, So that biological influence is so minor and the piece about the beauty standard typifying Caucasian features is huge when we look at how, you know, skin bleaching creams and hair relaxers and cosmetic surgery uh, and eyelid surgery, nose surgery, all typify these Western features. And, and these interventional quote interventions, I don't know what to, to, (laughs) these practices they actually work against our biological integrity, right? Like the cosmetic surgery, the chemical-based products we use, the obsessive dieting, even the self-hate and self-flagellation, that intrinsically works against our biological well-being. So I, I always think that's important to mention just to cut off anybody who's like, but it's biological. Right. Yeah, no, it's it's really, I think it's really important. I can imagine someone listening to this conversation and thinking to themselves like, 
okay, yeah, this this is all making a lot of sense from a very intellectual place. But the idea of actually not wearing my makeup or the idea of of letting myself stay at this weight that I deem 10 pounds heavier than I should be, quote unquote, is terrifying. What do mm-hmm. you say to her? Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, it is terrifying. And second of all, your feelings are completely lying to you. Your, your <laughs> feelings, and I know the dread, I know the terror, I know that icy sensation in your blood or that blackness that just completely covers your consciousness when you step on the scale in the morning. But your fe- those feelings and that, that reaction that you're having in your body is your body physiologically having a natural response to indoctrinated beliefs. And so if you want to change your feelings instead of changing your body, right? Cause you've tried changing your body for long enough. You've lost and gained those 10 pounds for the last 20 years and haven't gotten anywhere new. It, it might be worth trying something new, which would be changing those internalized beliefs so that you can change your feelings and, and use your, your mental energy elsewhere. And that is, it's definitely hard internal work, but it is so worth it. And it's so liberating. And I, I do give much more specific uh, examples of, of journaling and some speed writing techniques and, and basically brain rewiring techniques that I use with my clients in the book. And all you need for this is basically pen and paper. And so that's where more of the, the deeper self-work comes in. So what I'm hearing you say is that it can take a while and, and that we shouldn't, we shouldn't blame ourselves because it's, it's not our fault that we have these indoctrinated beliefs. It's, it's what we grew up with. It's what, it's what shaped our thinking and that it is scary because we're going to face potentially fear of judgment and fear of losing power or status or, and fear of that. If I do this, if I let go of this, that I'm somehow not going to be okay. I'm not going to be safe and that that is scary, mm-hmm. but that as we, as we work with changing our beliefs, it will get less. So it'll get mm-hmm. more comfortable. It will get more comfortable. It will get intoxicating and exciting. And, and then it you'll get a little angry. And that is always the process of leaving an abusive relationship. Really it's an emotional roller coaster and anger comes in in very profound waves throughout the process as you realize the truly dark intentions that the abuser had to control and actively harm and hurt you. And so actually recognizing that anger and processing and, and feeling that anger is an important part of the process as well. And the anger is part of what helps get us free. Yeah. Anger helps us draw, it helps us assert something that's true and it helps us draw boundaries and it motivates us out of stuckness. Mm -hmm. It's a very fiery force. Mm -hmm. Very young. So, and then, but we don't have to live there. Like once, once we, once we've utilized the anger, then it's, it's not like we have to stay mad at beauty culture forever. (laughs) Exactly. And that's the thing is, is the goal is Well, the goal for me in my own life and getting free of my corset and wanting to help get my clients and readers there is getting to a place where life feels so gentle. Like when we're at peace with our our bodies, then we feel at peace with life because the relationship we have with our body is a mirror for our relationship with the world, essentially. And so I think exactly what you mentioned that anger plays a fiery force to help us set boundaries, but then we can move through it and get to a place of true gentleness. And and I would like to say, because I've noticed this pattern in my own life and and some, I think some cultural zeitgeist around this where people do get stuck in that, that anger and they just stay what angry at the patriarchy or whatever object they'd like to put there. And I would offer that your healing's not done in that arena, (laughs) you ended with anger. (laughs) Yes. Right. (laughs) Right. Ideally we end with something that, that is actually giving back to us, right. That's Mm -hmm. something that, something that feels peaceful. Mm -hmm. So for people who, who might be curious about like, okay, so I need some new beliefs, Lauren, like that's what you're telling me. And, and that journaling can be a tool. Give me, give me a sense of 
a, maybe an example of a practice that I might explore if I want to start doing this work for myself of, of having a different relationship with my body, maybe being a, a true partner to my body rather than an owner of my body? Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing that I, I would recommend is writing a letter to your body and, and think back to the point in your life before you had the conscious awareness that your body was a liability or was less than and for many women. This is before the age of nine. Sometimes it's even earlier, especially for my clients who were put on diets at a young age or had weight comments put at them on at young ages. But think back to that time where there wasn't that kind of mental separation between your body and right a love letter to your body saying, Hey, I miss that so much. Here's what I remember about that time. And I would really love to heal my relationship with you. I would love to get to a place where I am honoring and respecting you. Um, you are my, you're my first soulmate. And I would love to experience that connectedness again. And so spend some time and, and consideration on that letter. And then Try writing a letter back to yourself from your body and see what she has to say to you. That's such a, a fun way of, of being able to open that dialogue. This, this, it, yes, letting your body literally giving it the microphone, letting it mm-hmm. have a voice. I'm imagining, I know a lot of my clients and patients who don't necessarily treat their bodies well for example, um, emotional eating when there's something stressful going on, or maybe overriding the body's desire to get up and move because they feel like their deadline is more important or like that, just that they get that it's like, oh, this isn't actually as important as the work that I am doing. Or, you know, that these, we can intellectually say like, okay, I have this intention to take better care of my body by moving more or not using using food to numb emotions but do it anyway <laughs> i'm mm-hmm. curious are there some pattern interrupts that you go to when people are are stuck in these patterns uh, that aren't necessarily where they're perpetuating a not so awesome relationship with their bodies mm-hmm. great question you know i want to go first to the point about emotional eating because it's an approach where a lot of people think, oh, the best, the only way to deal with this is more willpower or more rules and more control. And that's a natural thing to think, but what the vast majority of scientific literature shows is that the way to overcome that pattern is through a process called intuitive eating. And it's also called attuned eating in the literature. And this is basically um, breaking the mental indoctrination of diet culture, this this belief that we're supposed to override our hunger and fullness signals and follow diet rules in order to control our weight. And so it's really, I would say, from very difficult to impossible to heal your relationship with food, with willpower. And so in in those situations, that, that kind of willpower and discipline is better applied to practicing intuitive eating. Because it is going to take you outside your comfort zone. It's going to feel pretty scary to remove the food rules and actually get back in touch with your hunger and fullness signals. And there is a period in the process and inherent in the process where you're going to be eating more foods that you have restricted in the past than that feels comfortable to you. But that's where applying that discipline is helpful. And discipline is a force of love. It's quite different than like domination, which would be kind of fear or hate based. So that's a key thing to understand there, especially when it comes to the relationship with food. And then, you know, looking through that lens of uh, discipline in establishing other healthy patterns like around movement, that comes down to when, when I work with my clients, like, do you believe you deserve to be happy more often? Like, you know, if you, if you move and jump around, put some fun music on, you're going to, you're going to feel happier. 
how can we change your emotional set point? How can we give you more subconscious self permission to feel happier, uh, to feel better about yourself? Um, so actually one of the tools that I, I use for that is flower essences. Um, are you familiar with those Brody? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I love, used to use them a lot. They're such a powerful needle mover. And, and I know many acupuncturists who use them and they're, they're energy based, um, but they can help shift those subconscious patterns, that self-resistance. So I actually have a line of, of flower essences at floralsong.com. And one of the big ones that would help in these situations is called gentle grace for helping overcome that sense of like kind of underlying not enoughness where I don't deserve to feel better that can get in the way. I, I can, why, why do you still have this in stock? I, I, just, I can think of a lot of people who could really benefit from that one. It's, it's a beautiful healing tool. Awesome. Okay. So we are, by the time this airs, it will be in January. We will be in the middle of the new year's bombardment from basically diet culture, beauty culture, telling us that we need to join gyms and lose weight and try a new diet or a magic supplement or somehow change our external in order to get some sort of elusive internal prize of happiness. How can we bypass this onslaught of kind of beauty culture messaging and stay grounded in what's true for us? The avalanche is going to start. <laughs> you are so right. <laughs> so I think a key here is a lot of this messaging and propaganda from the diet industry is going to say, you've tried a lot, but you haven't tried this. And this is the magic pill, or this is new. This isn't a diet. This is a lifestyle. This is a new approach. And I see this messaging a lot with the, the Noom diet that's going around. And what is a good mental check is asking yourself, wait, am I really trying something new? Is it still in the paradigm of body control? Is it still in the paradigm of I need to change my body in order to feel better? Is it still in the paradigm of I'm doing this because I don't feel good enough right now? And if it is in those paradigms where you have acted in the past and it hasn't gotten you anywhere, different, then you know you're actually not trying a new approach. You're just doing the same old, same old, right? And you can actually make the, the, the choice, okay, do I want to get off the cycle or do I want to just keep repeating the cycle? And what would be trying something new in this situation would be seeing the whole situation differently. Um, like Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the consciousness that created it in the first place. Like you can't solve feeling out of control with your body by trying to control it better. Essentially, you can look at it from this new perspective of, you know, how do I have a new partnership with my body? How do I start listening to my body in a radically new way? Or how do I now have a, a relationship with my body where I fully accept her as she is right now um, instead of having my actions motivated from that sense of not enoughness. So that's a, an important kind of just internal checkpoint to make. I think that's, that's awesome. And because sometimes we do have legitimate goals. We want to feel better, you know, like that it's, uh, especially with the pandemic, a lot of people have gotten into patterns that aren't necessarily the ones that they want to keep for the long term, mm -hmm. or, you know, like that maybe that just not making time to, to, buy vegetables or cook them or that the, or not necessarily being in the habit of you know like getting into the habit of numbing out with Netflix until 2 a.m instead of getting enough sleep or or doing you know like not not getting up and moving or spending too much time sitting things that like are legitimate like I know I will feel better when I change this pattern but mm -hmm. that's very different like it, that it, obviously like as as a coach who helps people establish healthier habits it's like yeah it's really important that it's not just about it's it's not just about trying to control your behavior as much as it is looking at what's motivating the current pattern and is that actually in alignment with your values 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and is that ultimately going to like, if we multiply this habit out into the future, is it going to lead you to a future self that you're happy with or not? Mm-hmm. And so it, if people want to feel, for example, strong, or if they want, they want the habits that are going to help them age in a way that where they feel flexible and strong and vital and powerful and connected to purpose and connected to, to, to something that really matters to them. Like, are they prioritizing the right things in the present? And that is, I think, a, you know, the question of like, how do I want to feel or what's really important to me and what, what behaviors are going to support that would be, would be how I would frame it. Totally. And, and that reminds me of another assignment that I give my clients, which is how can you add radically more pleasure to, to your life right now? Ooh, radically that's more pleasure so and rest, awesome. Right. So because awesome. what we cultivate now, that's going to be our long-term outcome. And so when you're talking about like, okay, so somebody knows they're not taking the time to cook whole meals, like whole food meals with vegetables, I'll ask, okay, so how can we make your cooking and eating experience radically pleasurable? Like, can you put on mood lighting and music? And can you, you know, use that, that real ice cream instead of the, the fake stuff? Can you use real cheese and real butter instead of vegetable oils? Can you, you know, instead of um, having the carb-free bread, can you actually use a real nice bread or or gluten-free bread, because when we have all the flavors and textures represented and we have a really lovely ambient environment, it it naturally and kind of counterintuitively to our American culture, but it naturally facilitates health and balance that way. And that's why we look at wisdom cultures around food, you know, Japanese, French, uh, Indian cuisines, they all focus on that. And we've kind of forgotten in our culture. Yeah, I love that leading with desire as well, and and trying to you know entice ourselves towards towards healthier habits that we're that we're ultimately going to feel good about, and making them present day enjoyable, right? If the, and taking into account how can this be as much fun and pleasurable and sweet as possible, mm-hmm. and that could go for you know like lighting a candle by you know wh- where you're going to meditate. It's like yeah, candles aren't necess- they're not necessary for meditation. But if that's what gets you excited about sitting down on your cushion for a few minutes, then great, go for it. Mm-hmm. Like the, this is this is all about this is all about health and happiness and letting them go together as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Lauren, I feel like I could talk to you all day. It's it, we just there's you have so much to share that is helpful for people. And so in addition to getting the book, The Invisible Corset, how can people connect with you? Uh, well, the flower essences that I mentioned uh, are at floralsong.com, and I'm also on Instagram at body underscore connection underscore coach. And then, like you mentioned, my website, empoweredsustenance.com. Beautiful. All the links will be over at brodywelch.com and in the show notes, wherever you get your podcasts. Lauren Geertsen, you have been a delight to talk to today and a wealth of wisdom. Thank you so much for the important work you're doing in the world. Thank you so much, Brody. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line, head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learn something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend who you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.